Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, show 156. Today's show is brought to you by Get Healthy Now with Candice. Get Healthy Now with Candice is dedicated to helping people transform their lives through natural and plant-based medicines. If you'd like to learn more, contact Candice through GetHealthyNowWithCandice.com. Occupy Medical. Occupy Medical is a 503c organization dedicating to help make dedicated to making healthcare a human right. You can learn more at occupy-medical.org. And Hunter Creation, graphic design and website designers, putting your marketing ideas to reality. You can contact them about their new business starter package for just thirteen ninety seven. You get business cards, a logo, website, uh, Google local setup, a whole bunch of other little things that they have. Contact them at Patrick at huntercreation.com. Sue Sierra Lupe Consulting. Sierra Lupe Herbal Consulting is all about helping people with chronic conditions, both near and far, get better. If you'd like to learn more, contact Sue at thepracticalherbalist.com. Ace High Heat Graphics. If your school, group, organization, or nonprofit is looking for a great way to raise money this fall, contact Ace High Heat Graphics. They can help you with custom and printed shirts that allow you to get a great return so your your organization, school, or group can be well-funded. Contact them at sales at acehighheatgraphics.com. And finally, Candace, the Herbal Nerd Society. The Herbal Nerd Society is a group of wonderful folks who want to help support the Practical Herbalist and this podcast, Real Herbalism Radio, and get cool, advanced, and you know, just really awesome, cool, extra herbal information by joining the group of Herbal Nerds. Right. And as a member of the society, you get an ad-free viewing experience. You get access to articles uh, and podcasts that have been specifically written and produced for you, an Herbal Nerd Society member. You also have access to all of the past Real Herbalism Radio podcasts, which at this point are numbering in the 130 range. So everything from, you know... Uh, herbs for uh, depression to uh, the debate on Kratom to uh, medicinal marijuana. There's a lot of stuff in that backlog. So just for $49.99 a year or $15 uh, for three months or five bucks a month, um, you can become a member and help us support or help support us in producing all of that awesome content every week and every month. Hey, do you know we're on social media, Candace? Did you know? Did you we know? are. Yeah. The Practical Herbalist is on social media on Facebook. Yeah, and did you know there's over 7,000 likes on Facebook? I know. I couldn't believe that. I That's remember, shocking, when, I mean, yeah. last spring, it seemed like it was only at five. I know. So We've had an abundant few months here. Right? So if you want to join the conversation, Facebook's a great place to do that. Um, the group is pretty populated, and, and, and you know, we do try to monitor it and try to answer. Other thing, too, is if you're out and about in your garden or you're harvesting or you're out wildcrafting or whatever, hey, remember Instagram. Hashtag the practical herbalist. That's a great place to share your photo of being a homesteader, planter, herbalist, gardener, you name it. It can be on there and we'd love to see that. It's a great way for us to uh, see what everyone is doing. Hey, also, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but it'd be time now to talk about our books. Yeah, with the herb, back to school and starting to think about studying and planning next year's herb garden. It's time to look into some of your favorite herbs. And we have a series of, I think it's nine herbs that we've covered pretty extensively. Each herbal folio is written by Sue and myself and has got some a wide range of information. Yeah, um, those are, I mean, those are really well-researched, uh, you know, parts there. There's some really advanced herbalism in there. And for the price of those, I mean, I think they're, what, two ninety nine. dollars Yeah. For, for one of those, uh, you know, and you can read those on your laptop, your iPad, your Android device, your iPhone, oh, your Kindle yeah. Reader. You go to Amazon.com to find mm-hmm. them. Right, and they're on all on Amazon.com. You can do the you can do search the Practical Herbalist, uh, and you'll find all of the things written by, by Candace Hunter and Sue Sierra Lupe. Yeah, search Practical Herbalist Press, and there you'll you get go. all the titles that are currently available. Right, so uh, that's another great way to support us in uh, what we're doing here. So, uh, with that, Candace. It's time for the show. How do you balance modern medicine with traditional or natural approaches? The truth is, you can find a balanced path to healing your health issues. Today we're talking with Sarah Hanna Silverstein, Master Herbalist, Classical Homeopath, Mom of Seven, and Lactation Consult, oh, and author of Mutopia about doing just that. 
Now here are your hosts, Candace Hunter and Sue Sierra Lupe. I'm Candace Hunter. And I'm Sue Sierra Lupe. And, and welcome, welcome to, to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Radio. Welcome to the show, Sarah Hanna. It's really nice to have you here. I'm so looking forward. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Yeah, I I just got through, I have to admit, this morning, reading the last little piece of Mootopia, and I loved it. It Aww. was awesome. Thank did it you. put you in a good mood? It did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was a, a labor of love, and it took a long time to get all my facts and do my research, so I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I was really impressed. It was very well researched, but you also have a lot of um, experience your personal experience or experience with clients that you were able to draw on. Uh, that was really impressive as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, you. Could you talk a little bit about that? Tell people the kind of things that you currently do. And uh, I, I think it's actually fairly rare. So I have a clinic both in Brooklyn, New York and Los Angeles. I spend my time in both places. And I first began as a lactation consultant and I would help women with breastfeeding problems. And I was I was trained in traditional medicine and I was really starting to feel uncomfortable saying that women needed antibiotics for breast infections and different kind of allopathic medicines when I felt Women had been breastfeeding for thousands of years, and there had to be natural remedies and choices that they had. So I had studied herbal medicine when I was in university, and I was quite passionate about it. And then I did a five-year classical homeopathic program, and then I did three years of master herbalist studying. And what happened was I would obviously, because I work with a lot of pediatricians and obstetricians and general practitioners, I would always suggest, and I still do, that my clients would go to the doctor and get a diagnosis and get a prescription for the medicine that was recommended. But then I said that if you would like to and feel comfortable trying some herbs or homeopathy, that we could always have you know, that antibiotic in the refrigerator or on the counter. And what happened was the natural approaches worked better and faster and more thoroughly. And then my reputation started taking off so quickly because people really wanted to try natural herbs and homeopathy before allopathic medicines. Because one thing about herbs and homeopathy is they just do not share the side effects mm -hmm. of allopathic meds. And slowly but surely, I mean, it was slowly but surely, um, doctors started seeing that these things worked. I had a breast surgeon in Midtown Manhattan and he would have a woman with an abscess or a, a very intense case of mastitis. And he'd say, look, he goes, you know, there's this lady named Sarah Khanna in Brooklyn. He goes, I don't know exactly what she does, but my patients are really happy and she really seems to fix things. So why don't you just, you know, take a train out to her and if she can't fix it, come back to me. And that was <laughs> astounding. Nice. Because, you know, surgeons are trained to cut and yeah. he really kind of felt guilty doing it when he saw that what I was doing worked. And we worked together for years before he retired. And actually, when he went to retire, he, he called me up and he said, you know, you're my absolute last phone call because you're the one that's going to like beg me to stay. <laughs> you're the <laughs> only one. Everyone else is like, bye, see you later. And, and I was like, oh my God, you can't leave me. This is like a relationship. Like, uh -huh, I mean, right. we don't have divorce papers or anything. <laughs> so we really had this great relationship. And, and it was really astounding because if I felt that I couldn't treat something with herbs, I always had the confidence to go to him. And I knew that he would then take the correct route. So it was nice. this incredible relationship. And I do have them with other doctors. Doctors are always a little hesitant simply because, ladies, they're not educated in it. Yes. So I guess lecture at medical schools on breastfeeding. And about halfway through my discussion, I do talk about the clinical studies and the double blind studies and the anatomy and physiology. And I always open up the topic to so Docs, would you like to know about some herbal approaches to some of the problems we've been discussing? And their mouths open wide. They don't even know the questions to ask, but they, they, they sit there on the edge of their chair because they don't have any answers because they're just not, they don't know about it. You know what I mean? It's like if you studied, you know, a mechanic of, of a car and someone came in and said, can you help me build my house? I mean, they're just two different 
um, educational paths. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that doctors just they, they don't know. And that's where their fear comes in. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why working with an herbalist is such a great relationship. It's so nice to, you know, because we're following the do no harm model as well. You know, that's yes. the, and they have very, a, a lot of reason to be nervous because some herbalists have certainly done a poor job of healing. But to be fair, some doctors have done a poor job of healing. So if we're working with people that their job is just to make sure that they're doing the best job that they can in the do no harm model, and we're, we'll, we see to that, that that combination of those skill sets together is an advantage to the patients, and we're just going to see more and more and more of it. Yes, well, I like I, I began getting a lot of clients, um, a lot of I, I specialize in women's health and pediatrics, which is my passion. And I would have these kids that had chronic ear infections mm -hmm. and they had been on anywhere from eight to 15 rounds of antibiotics. And I always joke and say, you know, Albert Einstein has this this saying, you know, what is the definition of a crazy person, a person that tries the same thing over and over expecting <laughs> a different result. So, right. you know, the doctors weren't crazy and the parents weren't crazy, but like it obviously yeah. wasn't working for this child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would sit down with the parents and I would say, you know, it takes about six months for the fluid to reabsorb um, in the eustachian tubes often, but when we start working naturally, what we'll find is they will stop having ear infections. Right. So they can right. still go back to the doctor. The doctors, you know, especially newbies that I haven't worked with, will say, well, there's still fluid there. And I'd say, yay, but there's no infection. We're on our way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what happened was people were just, you know, understanding that there were other ways to treat ear infections. Now, I am going to preface and say that antibiotics have their place. Yeah. Um, you know, we're thrilled to have them. There's going to be a lot of occasions where they're needed, but we all know they're overprescribed and mm -hmm. doctors don't really have any other options. Okay. And we do as herbalists. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things that when I was, when I, when I had my son, we, I had to have an emergency C-section and there was a ton of antibiotics afterwards and it was something that I really regretted. I did it because it was major surgery. So I didn't, at the time, I didn't know what else to do. I just did what they said. But the result was a serious um, thrush for him and honestly for both of us. You know, he had no problem breastfeeding except that he started, you know, what is it like, what was that? Maybe a half a weekend, a weekend. He started crying and, and fussing and it was really awful. And we tried, we went to the doctor, we tried the prescriptions they gave us and yes. the side effects were worse than the thrush. And then an herbalist mentioned to us, well, why don't you try some um, gentian purple? So gentian violet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, gentian violet. violet thank yeah. you. Yeah. So yeah, we have all of my, like the first like five or six months of his life, all the baby pictures are him with this purple mouth. Yes. And we did not take any pictures of the purpleness I had. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, it was lower down I <laughs> know but it was a godsend I was so thankful and I think because we did not follow we didn't use the the prescriptions and all of that we were fortunate and our son didn't end up with like all the ear infections and we we grew up in an area where there were most of the other moms were having you know having their kids have ear infections or have um, colds and flus, mm -hmm. you know, yes. for the first couple of years. And we didn't have any of that because we followed an herbal path. Right. And these things have been in, like, that's the gentian violet that you're talking about. That's yeah, been listed around. in Merck. Yeah, it's been you around know, for ages. And and aloe is in surgical bandages. And, you know, the yeah. list goes on and on and on. But what people, I think, that are new to the idea of healing, either allopathically or through through uh, herbal medicine don't understand is there has always been that blending between yeah. we just have always. been we're, it's always been there yeah and we're just separating it out because there's so much more now to those fields so, so i the, tried very hard i mean i can't always say that i'm successful but i tried very hard to empower my clients to feel like they can integrate both alternative medicine with conventional medicine. Yeah. And that means that they can go get an MRI, they can get a blood test, they mm -hmm. can check 
blood pressure regularly, um, they get diagnoses. It doesn't mean that we have to follow their path of treatment because they're trained in acute care, which yeah. thank God, I mean, you know, you have a toothache and you need a root canal, like thank God we have that. But they're not trained in preventative. It's just not right. really, I mean, it's it's becoming part of um, medical school a little bit. Whereas as an herbalist, you know, I take a complete history of a client that comes in. I want to know their parents' health, their grandparents' health. If they know their great grandparents, I'm even happier. Their sisters, their brothers. And I make this whole family chart. So I have a handle or an idea of what their propensity is. So even if they're coming to me for like a chronic yeast infection, I'm going to take their history and I'm going to say, look at how much diabetes we have in your family. What can I suggest that you add so that we, you can possibly prevent that. So my clients are really happy because they come in and I definitely treat them acutely. That's what they're paying me for. But then they get the added bonus because I'm an herbalist and I'm looking at a big global picture, which doctors just don't have the time to do. No, they don't. And they don't have to. to. They don't have to, right. which is why we're there. Yeah, we, right. And we don't have to do it all either. No, that's, yeah. that's, I think some herbalists make that mistake. Well, I have to fix everything with this person. No, you don't. And you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Right tool, right place. Yeah. You know? <laughs> One step at a time, right? Yeah. 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 There's just, you just triage it, figure out what your priority is, what you can offer, and then find someone else to help the person. It's not about just your relationship between that patient and you. It's between that patient and where their health comes from. And so yeah. many, so many people, I think they think they're the only, they're the only tool in the box. It's just me. <laughs> and that's yeah. not true. Well, it's not it's true. just not no, true. No, for sure. But, but, uh, but the one thing that I do like is you're right. We have to treat the moment. And I have a lot of practitioners that I work with that I refer my clients to, but when I take that history, I like to open up their eyes, even if they're in their 20s or 30s, to just have it in the back of their mind because a lot of them will go, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize how many relatives have cardiovascular disease right. or I didn't yeah. realize there's so much osteoporosis. So even if I can just open that, that window up a little bit, because again, I'm in preventative. I'd much rather have a patient that we're preventing than already have, you know, high blood pressure, which of course well, we deal with all the time. And, you know, a lot of the little irritating things like a chronic yeast, yeast infection problem in a client who's got a history of diabetes that can be pointing to a damp constitution that if you take corrective matters now, not only do you clear up the yeast infection, but you prevent it from coming back and you help prevent diabetes at the same time because diabetes can be a can be derived from damp, damp stagnation. So, you know, yes, so much of it's connected. A lot of the little things that are irritating but don't seem life threatening are actually the first step on a path toward something much worse. And my clients that are in a pre-diabetic state will be more vulnerable to yeast overgrowth. So they exactly. tend to hold each other's hands. And that's why I'm looking at, yeah. you know, what, what's, what's facilitating this condition, exactly. even though it seems like a little acute. Yes. Yes, exactly. So I've got to ask you, was, did you set out in life? You're like, oh yeah, I'm going to become an herbalist. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to, you know, was that your plan or did you start off somewhere else and end up here? <laughs> <laughs> So funny because um, no, I was a childhood actress and I ah. did movies and television. I'm from LA, oh, of course, and I yep. was brought up in the spotlight. And I had this passion. I was just a plant person. Like when I went to university, I brought like 25 plants with me, and everywhere I went, I wanted to learn about the plants that were growing. So I was actually invited through um, Yale School of Drama to attend Oxford University, which was one of the biggest and most prestigious places to be. And I could be found sitting on the floor of the library reading botanical books. <laughs> and I was supposed to be studying Shakespeare and Chekhov. <laughs> and it's like they paled in comparison to what I was finding. So um, I didn't get A's in all of my <laughs> classes that summer. Because, I mean, I did like that Shakespeare spoke about so many herbs. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it bored me. So it was when I came back from that program that I went, acting's fun and nice but I like plants. Nice. There you go. I love that you found your passion through Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> one, one of them yes. or, or my, or, or my boredom in it that pushed me <laughs> to, to read other things. But I learned a lot that summer, let me tell you, yeah. but that was it. And I really, you know, when I first had children, um, as a mother of seven, I really, you know, was trying to be that really good patient, listen to the doctor, take their advice. And my daughter had a chronic stuffy nose and she mm. was snoring. I'd like to say like a truck driver, but I've never really <laughs> heard a truck driver snore. You know, Maybe I don't know. Maybe more like, do, a <laughs> like a truck. But she was really loud and she wasn't getting better. And when I would give her the antihistamine, she used to tell me she was really little. She goes, it makes my brain feel fuzzy, fuzzy. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I, I had studied herbal medicine, but I didn't have feel the confidence yet to yeah. Um, work with my daughter and I took her and she was getting chronic strep and I took her to a Chinese herbalist and within six to eight weeks my daughter stopped having strep and um, stopped needing a tissue um, in her sleeve and her backpack and with her every second and that's when I realized like I really need to delve into herbal medicine. I chose Western herbs because I really liked the idea of working with things that grew locally. Um, but that was my turning point. Like I, I, I saw how it worked with my own daughter. Isn't it amazing how children often push us into awakening, like getting over our fears? Because I mean, I, I read a lot of us have, you know, I read a lot about plants and herbs and herbalism, but it wasn't until I had a son staring up at me that I actually said, no, I got to actually do this. I, I yeah. can't just, no yeah. more armchair herbalism. I have to actually do mm. it. Now, a word from Thomas Easley about the Journal of Functional Herbalism. The Journal of Functional Herbalism is a free online journal promoting the integration of traditional Western herbalism, clinical nutrition, and functional medicine. It's published by the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine, and you can find the Journal of Functional Herbalism at functionalherbalism.com. Yes. And it's so funny. I always tell this story because, um, as we know, as herbalists, herbs are bitter. <laughs> and, you know, I teach my kids when, you know, my clients, when they get to a certain age, well, if your drippy nose is bitter, you need something bitter because like cures like, but sometimes when you have little kids, you know, I do put them in glycerites and I do, you know, dilute them in grape juice or, you know, a little cranberry juice, but they still taste bitter. So I remember this story of this child that had chronic strep. I mean, it was just chronic. And so I told the mother or I suggested, you can never tell anybody, but I suggested that we give herbs two to three times a day for a couple months to build up the child's immune system. And every time the mother gave herbs, the kid would scream like a maniac. So oh, she came to my oh, office God. and we, I taught her a little bit of child abuse. Um, we <laughs> on the couch and we kind of, I showed her how to kind of sit on him and open up his lips and shoot in the herbs. And she said, can I do that? I'm like, yeah, I suggest you do it. So it was like a month of fighting and she kept on calling me up and saying, he's not getting better. And I'm like, well, he hasn't had strep. So He's getting better. Yeah. I know it's still a fight. And one day she had been a little lax on them. You know, things happened. She hadn't given it for like a week. And he came home from play group and goes, mama herbs, mama herbs. And she oh. said, what? And he said, ouchie, ouchie. And he was pointing oh. to his throat and he took the herbs and never complained again. Uh -huh. And that Beautiful. story always stays with me because although he didn't like the taste, which he's allowed not to like the taste, yeah. but he felt it in his body and this, and he was young. And the second he started to feel those symptoms of strep again, mm. the yucky taste of the herbs were much more tolerable yeah. than that feeling of yeah. strep. And he never, and to this day, this boy is 18 years old and he actually was away at school and got mono and he actually called his mom and said, can you get a bottle of herbs from Sarahana and mail them to me? Oh. And he's an, he's an herby because they were. That is so, wonderful. And that's, that's my story. That, I love that. That I is so it. great because now he's too big to sit on. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And we don't need to, we don't need to. So, yeah. you know, believe me. And I always tease my clients. I'm like, well, if you were born one or two generations ago, you'd be stuffing some uh, some fish oil. What was the name of that fish oil? Everybody, oh, castor oil. Not castor, yeah, castor oil. oil. Cod, cod liver oil. Cod cod liver. Liver. Oh, God. And I was like, uh, your kid would be screaming and yelling just like the herbs. So it mm-hmm. looks like mom's been doing this for generations. We've been doing <laughs> yeah. it. Right. Oh, it's not so bad. We're putting the cod liver oil in the orange juice. Oh, yay! Oily orange juice. Yeah, that's so great. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, um, that's what I've seen. I've seen that kids will remind their moms to take the herbs and Mm. they ask for it and they, they feel it. And, you know, you know, they're not being sold by advertising because they're not, when they're watching their cartoons, there are not ads for, hi, take your herbs to feel better. So Mm. it's not advertisement that's pushing these kids to take herbs. Herbs are for kids. (laughs) That's so funny. Yeah, it works though. I mean, my son, he knows which area of the herb cabinet is families allowed to touch. And he goes in and picks his herbs out when he feels like he's coming down with something. He makes his own blends, just taking, you know, from the bottles as he wants. And Mm -hmm. he's 16 now. And and although he tells me herbs don't work, I've seen many tincture bottles enter his bedroom. Right. And come yeah. out considerably less full. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm not going to miss I that know, to you yet. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting though, because I, I, I raised my kids backwards. I was in LA for the summers and New York for the winters. And I used to come spring while I was still in New York. I used to um, um, grow plants on my fire escape. Mm-hmm. And I saw that my kids would every day come home from school and look and see if the plants were growing and were the vegetables already getting beautiful flowers. And I think you're going to be pretty hard pressed to find kids that don't fall in love with herbs given the opportunity. So I think it's just a natural connection that, especially because I deal more with city folk than rural folk. But for me, um, I find that when kids get exposed to plants, they, they just, it, it resonates with them. It just does. It's magical for them. I mean, it's magical for all of us, but when you're living in a city, it's not, you don't take it for granted, Mm, you know, in the country, it's pretty easy to take it for granted because it's all over the place. But in the city, there's, there's lots of plants. And I love the story that you tell about discovering plants in Brooklyn Mm -hmm. in the book, in the book, after talking to the professor. Yes. Yes. So that was very interesting because I really wanted to study herbal medicine. I was already a lactation consultant and I knew, I knew a lot about herbs, but I needed to, you know, become a professional if I was going to help people. And so I, you know, being a city girl, I like showed up, you know, in my high heels and my sunglasses Mm -hmm. on my head and my nails done. And everybody was coming from this tri-state area and everybody else was kind of like a little more hippies with their (laughs) Birkenstocks, you know? And so I'm sitting there and the teacher said, if you want to heal a person, just see what grows around their house. So of course I stomped over to her afterwards. I'm like, um, have you been to Brooklyn? Um, do you know what goes around Brooklyn? There's like concrete, there's fire escape, there's dog poop for sure. And we've got cars. I'm like, which one of those is going to heal my clients? So she stuck a Peterson guide in my hand and said, <laughs> just look around. So I grabbed my husband who was like, Oh no, where are you taking me now? And I walked just around my city block and within one block, I found 10 medicinal plants growing through the cracks of the concrete. I had shepherd's purse, literally on doorsteps. Oh, I had um, ginkgo trees growing. Oh. There was burdock growing everywhere. There was yellow dock. And I was astounded. There was a mulberry tree. Thank God it was spring, by the way. There was a mulberry <laughs> tree. I mean, there was... I realized within one block that I could make medicine for maybe 20 different conditions yeah. right there in Brooklyn. Yeah. Now, and obviously, I source my herbs outside of Dirty City, huh. but I do plant walks, medicinal weed walks around Brooklyn, and people are just astounded by it. Yeah. Just astounded. And they're there. They grow every Plantain was everywhere. I mean, it was just lovely to see. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily encourage people to do all of their medicine from the plants in the parking lot. But if you think <laughs> about it, the plants that are like growing right next to your driveway are encountering the same problems, the same challenges, the same atmosphere, all of it that you're encountering. So they're Back creating they're their, yeah, they're creating mm -hmm. their defenses to thrive there. They can help you thrive in the same place. Their, you know, essential oil balance is perfect. So the, yeah. the thing I think is fun with those herb walks is letting people connect with the environment they live in. If they know about these plants, they're not just gracing through uh, going from Facebook post to Facebook post, but they're looking yes. around and saying, oh, this is, this has a story and this has healing properties and this, I have a connection with this environment. It's not just something to pass by with my blinders on, only seeing the ugliness or just a passage. They're seeing this is part of the world that I live in and I need to connect with it. And that itself is a healing practice, I think, probably helps people with their moods too. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I, I know that like when we get to the linden tree, people are always like, oh my gosh, Sarahana, this is one of my favorite smells because linden yeah. flowers are so stunning mm -hmm. and when yeah. I talk to them about the the ability of linden to help calm and soothe the body relax the body after a hard day it helps with digestion they're always like mm -hmm. oh I always love this tree so you know they had this like connection but they had no idea what that connection was all they'd remember is parking their car in front of a linden tree and not minding if the flowers were on their windshield because it smelled so beautiful yeah, so right. it does open their eyes you're right it does it, it it if we can get people to stop looking at their phone screens <laughs> and look up when they walk i mean there's there's just there's wonderful things there are in fact one of the things i want them actually to be focusing on is your book mutopia that's an awesome Thank book you. Thank you. So I was working with women and a lot of, you know, very successful women. I do work with men also. I don't want to leave men out of this. It's just that women tend to come forward with their emotional challenges yeah. a lot easier than men. And I found that, you know, my, my, my tagline with the book is be in control of your mood so your moods don't control you. So I, I say in the book that, you know, like anger is a wonderful mood because it can give you that fire in your soul, that impetus to make change. You know, I tell the story that my that, um, we live in the canyons when I was growing up in Los Angeles and there was one corner where there was a near accident every single day. Oh. And my mother was getting really angry about it. And so she called the city and said, you know, we can't take it. I mean, it's really dangerous. We have kids. And the city said to her, well, if you get a petition and get a thousand signatures, we'll put a stop sign there. And my mom did it. And yes. so if my mom was kind of passive and like, yeah. oh, you know, near accident, but she had this fire in her soul from this anger and she was able to make change. So I'm trying with the book to um, show the positiveness of these moods as long as you don't get stuck yeah. in that angry place. So if a person's going to be angry for too long, they will have breakdown of the immune system, breakdown of their marriage relationships and friends, mm -hmm. you know, breakdown of so many things. But we can't look at anger as negative. We need to, to you know, honor it and 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 figure out how it can benefit us. Right. And so that's one of the reasons that I wrote the books because, you know, you know, there's positive and negative to everything in life. And I wanted to discuss the positive and negative to moods because I didn't think it was discussed much. Yeah. yeah. I think if you are taking those moods, like you said, and being balanced with them and using it as a impetus for making positive change, rather than what we often see is people taking moods and using it as an impetus to either destroy others, or I was angry. That's why I hit for bad his or behavior. Her, yeah. right? Or, or I was blissful, and so I, I didn't see the things, the changes that I needed to, to have. Either of those two mm -hmm. are not acceptable. We just, we, we have problems that we have to solve as adults, and if we use our moods to help us move to, through those decisions and keep us inspired, that's great. But yeah, as you said, it can be a problem as well either an excuse for harming or an excuse for not doing enough. Right. So my book, um, 
uh, is is a guide. I mean, we talk. I talk about um, herbal remedies um, that are available, and I talk about essential oils, and I also talk about things like random acts of kindness. You know, like if you're having a really bad day, which we all have. I mean, you could wake up and there's a flat tire and then you get it fixed and you go to your cleaners and they like burnt your favorite dress. I mean, like, you know, we have these days that are just horrible sometimes. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. what studies show is that random acts of kindness, lower blood pressure, lower cortisol levels and increase your oxytocin, your feel good levels. So yeah. What I want in my book is that people need to know that, you know, like just becoming a good athlete or good at driving or good at baking, it takes practice. No one's good at it right away. And I feel it's the same people, same thing for people that do struggle with moodiness. Like they expect to one day wake up, snap their fingers and not be moody. And I'm like, no, you need to work on it. You know, it's not the moment that you're raging at your husband. It's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the weeks before. So one of the things yeah. I have my clients start to do is just random acts of kindness. Just yeah. open the door for someone. If you're standing in line and someone's, you know, a couple cents short, you know, offer a nickel and, you know, like just help, help someone carry their bags to the car. And, mm -hmm. you know, you only purchase two items. And when my clients do this at first, they're like, it's never going to help. Sarah Khan. I'm like, come on, I need a pill for my doctor. I'm like, well, let's just try some random acts of kindness. And yeah. That makes a huge difference yes, in our moods. It absolutely it does. does. It does. And when you practice it and keep practicing it, I at least for me, I because I started that when I was much younger. And there was a point where I had a fella come up to me and when I was leaving a company and I was just going to do a different job. And he came up to me and said he was really sorry to see me going because I was one of the few people that always smiled at him and always held the door for him. And it made him feel so good. And he was an immigrant and he, the job he was doing was not one of the ones in that particular company that was like the exalted jobs. He was right. like me. I, I was doing, I was a writer at the time and it, I was a technical writer. So we were kind of, you know, second class citizens, if you will, because we weren't the, you know, the engineers were the stars. And he right. was, he was in the production line and, you know, so I was always really nice to him because I, someone, I don't remember who it was way back then said something about random acts of kindness. And I decided to do that. And at that point I'd been doing it for five or six years. And when he said that to me, I realized that that was all of those random acts from all the years coming back to pop up and say, Hey, it really does make a difference mm -hmm. in people's lives. You may not know, mostly hear it but it does. Mm -hmm. And the person that you're being kind to mm -hmm. doesn't really care whether you're in a good mood or not. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like, like you could be just like, you know, yeah. hating not only your husband and your kids and your neighbors and everyone around you. You know what I mean? Right. But if you do that, you know, hold that door open for that pregnant woman that's carrying a toddler, like, She's not checking in. Hey, are you in a good mood and you're doing this? She's like, oh my God, you just saved my life. Yes. So, <laughs> you know, you don't have to be in a, in a, in a mood to help people, to help people. Yeah. And, you know, they say like, it's a domino effect. It like is. you're nice to one person. They may not yell at their kids in the car. You know, yeah. it, it, it really has a domino effect and we need to believe because we are energetic beings, mm -hmm. you know, Everybody, everybody knows that when they meet a person, like immediately, you know, whether you like them or not, you know, like immediately. Yeah. And it's an energy that they're giving off. I mean, it's not, you know, their clothing or, you know, their look. So if we start to believe that we are energetic beings, which is so hard and, you know, this has no religious connotation. It's just knowing that we're energetic beings, then we can try to give good energy. And, you know, that takes work. It, 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 it's work and, and you reap the benefits with your moods. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's empowering too. I know yeah. in the clinic that I work at, we have um, an unhoused population that, that comes to our clinic all the time. And there I am met at the door. I'm literally met at the door by people saying, Hey Sue, can I help bring this in for you. Can I help with this? Give me a broom. I'll sweep here. They, they are the people that I work with are shunned by society, but when they come to my clinic, they know that they'll be treated with respect. And I yeah. always have something for them to do so that they feel that same thing that you're talking about. Of 
I am doing something. I am, in, I am important enough to help. Yeah. I am right. making a difference. I am a good person. And it is part of the healing process. I'm really glad right. you pointed that out. Well, I, so, I also yes. noticed in the book at the end, you have a whole list of stuff, a 30 day, uh, or the 90 the, day, 90 day, sorry, 90 day my bad, plan. Um, yeah. 90, 90 day plan of, of suggestions oh, to help people get into better moods. And you have a, a giant, a giant list for every single week chunk to help people get, oh, get through that. And I was really pleased to see that as part of more of a holistic manner for helping people heal. And I really encourage people to, to check out your book, Moodtopia. Could, um, I, I'm afraid we're going to have to end this interview, but um, is there, how do people get a hold of you so they can find out more about your book? And then I'm sure you have stuff on the website and I've seen your YouTube videos. Tell us about that, please. Sure. So I have a website, sarahana.com. That's S-A-R-A-C-H-A-N-A.com. I know you're going to be bringing, um, sharing links. Yes. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram because those are the places you have to be to be a modern woman. Um, I do have a lot of YouTube videos all about um, quick little tips on herbs. And my book, Moodtopia, um, is available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and it's available all over the internet. Um, you can email me through my website. Um, it may take a couple days to get back to you, but either myself or my staff will. And you can send me a message on Instagram, which is what a lot of people are doing now. And that's Sarahana with an S at the end for Silverstein. And um, it's a really, it's a really easy medium to get in touch with. Oh, thank you very much for being with us today. Yes, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, ladies. This has been a pleasure. As always, put an herb on it. The statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with a healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication, or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies are based on individual results and do not constitute a guarantee that you will achieve the same results.